And what a beautiful thing it is. How we rejoice with them and how they rejoice with each other. Anytime reconciliation can be effected according to the will of God. A bringing together of two who have been alienated. One from the other. Friends, that was the picture of the world. We as sinful humanity were alienated. We, we were estranged from a holy and sinless God. You know, you let modern religion to say what they want to say. I know God is love. I know God's a God of grace. But I'll tell you what, God's holiness will not be infringed. God is a holy God. If not, Jesus Christ would have never gone to the cross. That's why he had to go to the cross. It's to pay the price for our sins. And thereby he effected reconciliation. We are reconciled by his death. Brought back to one with God. Now, this is an exciting passage. Hold your place here in 1 Peter. Go quickly. We're running out of time. Go quickly to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I want you to read this because this is exciting. You probably can quote, some of you can quote verse 8. But God commended, New King James says, demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now notice where the emphasis is where when verse 8 closes. It's on His death. Circle that. He died for us. But read on. Verse 9. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. You see the future tense? Shall? See, Jesus died, and there's a lot that He accomplished in His death. But guess what? Jesus didn't stay dead. Okay? Put verse 10 with it. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God, and he returns back to the emphasis earlier, by the death of his son, and I'll miss this, much more than being now reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Can I paraphrase this for us tonight? What's exciting about Romans 5, 8 through 10 is Paul is saying this. He's saying, you look at what all Jesus accomplished by his death. And if Jesus could accomplish all of that in his death, how much the more can Jesus accomplish in his life? See, in Hebrews 7 and verse 25, he ever lives and he's not inactive. And if you have the idea that Jesus has gone back to heaven and that he's done all he's got to do and, and he's now inactive, you're wrong. And I don't say that to be arrogant. That's just not right. According to Hebrews 7 and verse 25, He now lives at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for Cliff Goodman. That's right. For you. He's making intercession. Part of the expression, He's pleading our case before the throne of God. And He's doing that actively now. And so if Jesus could do all that he could do in his death, Paul's point in Romans 5 is just think or try to imagine what all he's now able to accomplish in his life. That's exciting. Because we've been reconciled by his death. And one day we'll be saved from wrath through his life. Chapter 4. We're redeemed by his blood. We're healed by his strife. We're reconciled by his death. We're talking about the redemptive work of Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1. We are instructed by his example. We're instructed by his example. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. What Peter is here in doing is he's holding up Jesus as an example. And as we've already touched on this this morning, I don't have to rehash this in too great of detail, but he's saying that Jesus had to suffer in the flesh and that we're going to have to suffer in the flesh also. But he's telling us to look to the example of Christ. Be instructed by His example. Now what's interesting about this point in Peter is Peter is revisiting something that he developed in chapter 2. 
So back up with me to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, where he says, For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Jesus suffered for us, leaving us an example. We're instructed by his example that we should follow in his steps. Now, what is his example? Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. What is his example? Verse 23. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Now, that's where the rubber stops me in the road. Because I, I regretfully have to admit to you that sometimes when I'm reviled or spoken to abusively or in a harsh manner, you know what my first inclination sometimes is? I want to revile back. That's not right. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again? When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Friends, you mark this reference from one to the other. Beside chapter 2, verse 23, you put 4 and 1. And go over back to chapter 4 and verse 1 and you put chapter 2 and verse 23. One is an inspired commentary on the other. From these passages, we learn that we are instructed by Christ's example. Not to retaliate. Not to take revenge. Not to lash out. But instead to count it all joy that we've been counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Now finally, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. And in this fifth place, I want you to notice with me verse 10, I believe it is. 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. We are called by His gospel. We are called by His gospel. But the God of all grace who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. See, Jesus Christ, in a sense, is the agent here. How is it that Jesus Christ calls us? Well, we learn elsewhere. It's through His gospel. And friends, please hear me. It's not through a still, small voice that you hear in the night. If you hear that, I don't know who or what it is, but it's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. And I'm not laughing. It's not Jesus. It's not by being out in the cornfield and hearing the wind whisk through the, the tassels. You say it out of the tassels. And that, that's not what God is speaking to. I know how God speaks to us. I know. The Bible tells us. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, Paul would write, Whereunto, that is to salvation, He called you by our gospel. That's how God calls us. He calls us through the gospel message. Why do you think Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach what? The gospel. Preach it to whom? Every creature. Why? Because that is the manner, yea, that is the only manner in which, by which, and through which God calls the souls of men to salvation. If a man or a woman is being called by Jesus, they're being called through this medium right here. Whether they're hearing it preached, whether they're reading it for themselves, they're being called through the gospel. Friends, that's a powerful, powerful message. In Romans 1 and verse 16, you can quote it with me like what Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the it's interesting that in Acts chapter 20 and perhaps in other passages I can't recall presently, but in Acts 20 we read about the gospel of His grace. The message of God's grace. And so we are so indebted, yea, eternally indebted to God for the redemptive work of Christ our Savior. Because of what Christ has done, we are redeemed by His blood. We are healed by His strife. We are reconciled by His death. We are instructed by His example. And we are called by His gospel message. That's grace. That's grace. And so part of this expression, I don't mean to be irreverent, I don't mean to be 
<coughs> disrespectful in any way, but I heard one say one time that at the cross, Jesus essentially said to all of us in the world, if you go to hell, it will be over my dead body. Let me think about it. He gave his life on Calvary's cross so that none of us, none of us have to go to hell. That horrible place. You know what that's called, friends? That's called grace. We've learned a little bit about that tonight from the book of First Peter. Let's close your Bibles and prepare now to sing the song of encouragement. Friend, if you're here tonight and you've not yet become a beneficiary, a recipient of God's rich grace, you need to obey the gospel tonight. We encourage you to do so. The Bible tells you to believe in Jesus Christ. He's your only Savior, Acts 4 and verse 12. The Bible tells you to repent, to consciously choose to turn away from the practice of sin, Acts 17 and verse 30. The Bible tells you to confess with your mouth that Jesus is who He said He was, the Son of God, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And the Bible tells you tonight to be immersed in water, baptized for the washing away of your past sins, Acts 22 and verse 16. You can obey the gospel tonight in response to God's grace. Brother and sister, if you've done those things in times past, but tonight, tonight you've wandered from the fold of safety. God still loves you. God wants you to return, but God's not going to forget you. God's not going to twist your arm. He's not going to force you to humble yourself, to repent of sin, confess wrong, and then seek His forgiveness. He tells us in James 5, 16, 1 John 1, 9, that as we do those things, He'll forgive us. But we need to come home. And if that's your need tonight, come back to the grace of God, won't you? As we stand and as we sing.